Thank you, Jill. Was that an Arthur Sullivan uh, composition? Oh, so somebody plagiarized somebody. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. In this jolly, snowy day. Um, when a, a job took me, uh, trans took us transferred up to upstate New York to the Finger Lakes region, uh, when we were there uh, a week or two, we went to we were trying out churches, and we went to one just south of Ithaca. And it was uh, not a, a cold day, maybe th for there anyway. It was 35 degrees, um, cloudy, but not a lowering sky. And uh, we went inside, and I suppose the service lasted about an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, it was blinded. All the windows, like here, were blinded. And... Uh, it was a good thing because it was a very excellent sermon given by a visiting, um, a visiting uh, university professor, uh, a, uh, uh, and he didn't look nearly old enough to be a university professor, but that's a problem that I have, not them. But, you know. but at any rate, um, it was an excellent sermon. And uh, had it not been for the blinds, uh, he would not have been listened to as assiduously as he was because when we emerged from the building, there was four inches of snow. I mean, it all just must have come tumbling down in that amount of time. People, but women were in heels and all sorts of stuff because it just it, it had not been in the forecast or anything like that. It was just a, a shock, as we saw. So the, the windows are blinded, so if, if a swirling blizzard develops, you will not be distracted from this message. <laughs> so uh, let's pray. Father, we see your works, we see the works of your Son, and we glory in them. And here we have uh, the, the privilege and the opportunity to uh, witness uh, yet another uh, miracle of his. And uh, we ask your blessing on our time uh, in the Word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you want to uh, get to Luke 17 in your Bibles, and we're going to be starting with verse 11. Uh, <clears throat> the... Uh, you know that we are, we are attempting uh, a cr chronological uh, approach to the uh, Gospels, and so we move from Gospel to Gospel. We're following uh, a track uh, that was laid out by uh, Ariel Ministries, and uh, we attempt, it's the best attempt at trying to find what's next. So we, uh, we have... Um, been in John, and we have uh, seen uh, the raising of Lazarus and the uh, opposition and reaction on the part of the uh, Pharisees and uh, religious leadership. Uh, and now, and this of course was very close to Jerusalem, uh, we see in the raising of Lazarus very careful planning on the part of the Lord. And uh, when we in this, and perhaps it really began my realization of, of, how, of how planned and organized it was, was from, from that uh, last Feast of Tabernacles. And we saw the set-piece battles going on between the Lord and the uh, religious leadership. We see their, the, the density of their um, prejudice. And we see how they think they're scoring points and they're not. We see the, the majesty and the power of Christ. And it occurred to me, it occurred to me that this sounds like another, another time. It has elements of another time. And that is the time when the Lord was talking to Pharaoh. And he wanted to bring his people out of bondage. And that's what Christ wants for his people, to come out of bondage. And he talked to Pharaoh by his power. He talked to him in plagues, dreadful plagues. And Pharaoh's heart, hard heart, hardened from him and hardened by the Lord, would not give in. And if you look at it a little bit like that, 
You see, of course it's different because there are miracles still, but there are miracles, they're good miracles. People are being healed, people are being saved, people uh, are raised from the dead. And if you look at it, you see that the intensity and the size of these miracles is increasing. You've got, and when you see the man born blind, uh, born blind, given sight, no one has ever done that before that has given sight to a man born blind. And you know, of course, that the brain forgets the eyes. His brain never did know his eyes. And so he could have a perfect set of eyes plopped right in his head and it wouldn't do any good. Everything, the minutest detail has to be accomplished for that. And then we see the raising of Lazarus. No one has raised anybody from the dead who's been in the grave for four days. No one. These are, you see their reaction. This was very ably covered by John uh, as uh, last week. You see that they wanted to kill Lazarus as well. That's the smoking gun on this thing. That shows that it's absolutely true. And so it's not Pharaoh anymore, it's the Pharisees. And he is ramping up their condemnation with these miracles and this testimony. We're only weeks away from the crucifixion when indeed an act will take place which will free the people from bondage if they wish and if they will believe. Just as the first Passover was the last in the plagues that freed the people of Israel from the bondage of the Egyptians. And so I want to read, just to get our hearts all stirred up about this, I want to read... Psalm 2. Because these cats in Jerusalem think they're in charge. They think, they're, they think they've got a good plot going to kill Jesus. How wrong they are. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like pot a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. They are not going to win this battle. The Lord is winning the whole time. He's in charge. And he's got another miracle here. And we're going to take a look at this and see how interesting it is. So, he is on the way to Jerusalem. Verse 11 of Luke chapter 17. He is on the way to Jerusalem. He was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. So, this gives us a clue as to what we will discover later is that there is a mixed constitution in this group of lepers. And as he entered the village, 
he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. Now, leprosy is a term used uh, generically in the Bible to cover a number of skin ailments, of, of manifest skin ailments. Uh, of course, the skin is the largest organ in the body. And when your skin is in trouble, you're in big trouble. People who have all over skin diseases suffer horribly, horribly. Now, this thing can be something anywhere between a flaking of the skin all the way up to the big one, which is now called um, Henson's, I think it's Henson's disease, Han Hansen's disease, uh, because of a, of a Norwegian uh, uh, doctor, a researcher. Uh, it's named after him in these days. Uh, there, there is no a cure, uh, uh, has, there is no cure at this time for Hansen's disease. In fact, not until the 20th century was there a cure for it. But also, it's not deadly in of itself. Uh, if, we, if we're talking about um, Hansen's disease. But uh, let's see uh, if we look here at uh, what the Lord uh, has told his people about, about uh, leprosy. So in Numbers uh, chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous, or has a discharge, and everyone who is unclean through contract, contact with the dead. You shall put both male and female, putting them outside the camp, that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. And the people of Israel did so, and put them outside the camp, as the Lord said to Moses, so the people of Israel did. So this was pretty serious. I mean, being put outside the camp means that you're outside the protection, you're outside the community. I mean, it is, it's awful. It's awful. Undoubtedly, people would bring food out to them uh, and so forth and care in their way. But uh, you're no longer in society anymore. There's another uh, reference that we have to uh, leprosy, which is uh, interesting in Exodus. I'm sure you all know this, uh, where uh, the uh, Lord is uh, talking to Moses and giving him his uh, ministry. And uh, down uh, in uh, chapter 4 of Exodus, down in, uh, in uh, the point where he is giving him the staff, he says, you know, what is in your hand? This is verse 2. He says, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it, but the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became the staff in his hand. And of course, this is at, this is at the request of Moses, because he wants, he, he says, well, how, how, why, is anybody going to listen to me? Which is a valid statement. And so he gives him this, this, this trick, as it were, that he can do, this miracle. And then... Uh, he says again in verse 6, he says again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak and he took it out and behold, it was leprous like snow. Then the Lord said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand insi back inside the cloak and when he took it out. Behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. These are attention getting uh, elements here. It's so, so it's, it's uh, if you, if you put uh, next to the serpent, which is the icon of evil, uh, then uh, leprosy is next to it, and it's uh, not uh, it's not very pleasant. Um, we saw in uh, the very ably read uh, uh, passage this morning uh, the that uh, that leprosy is used can be used as a punishment. Gehazi is punished with leprosy. 
Now, whether or not Naaman was punished with leprosy or not, I don't know, because we don't get much more on Laman than, uh, Naaman than that. But Gehazi, definitely, this was a, and it was a, a punishment that was to be handed down to, to generations because of what he did, lying, cheating, stealing. Well, when somebody is afflicted with something, there's a natural tendency on all of us to come up with a reason why they have been thus afflicted. And so now everyone has an excuse to assume that leprosy is a punishment for wrongdoing. Uh, we see that um, when, uh, when Miriam, is it, is, it, is it Miriam? I'm sure I'm, I've lost my, uh, I've lost my, um, my reference on it, where they're, they're grumbling against Moses. And, uh, and uh, she gets leprosy and is put out of the, uh, of the camp for seven days. That was a punishment for grumbling against Moses' leadership. So we have uh, that. We also have uh, the, uh, oh, it's in Numbers 12, 116. So we also have the example of uh, the king Uzziah. Uh, he had gone into the temple and wanted to uh, wanted to present uh, fire at, um, in, in part of it, burn incense, rather, burn incense. And uh, he became leprous uh, as a punishment f- for doing this. So it is associated with evil. It is associated with... is associated with uh, punishment. So Hansen's disease is, is interesting because it's a, sort of, it's a sort of narrative about our own, our own evil. It's not deadly in of itself, but what it does is rem- this leprosy grows most vociferously in, the, uh, in your skin, but it also grows throughout the rest of your body, but it does so faster in the skin. And you lose, and it, it attacks the nerve, so you lose your s- sense of touch. So what happens is, if you don't have a sense of touch, you don't have any feelings in your extremities or on your skin, your skin, you injure yourself. You just naturally, in the course of your life, you injure yourself. I remember when you pick something up, it's hot. You know. Now, it can get quite hot, and the signal from the skin to the brain is fast enough for you to pull it away without scalding. It can be so hot that it, it doesn't happen in time, like a stove or something like that, and it will burn. I remember remarking to a young woman at work, and I said how extraordinary it is that we do have that facility to get that signal into the brain, to be able to move fast enough out of something that's burning. It's going to burn us or scald us. And she said, uh, yes, isn't it wonderful how we evolved that way? Okay. <laughs> well, that's the wrong thing to say to an ancient Christian, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? There were armies of people who were, had their hands burned because they hadn't evolved enough to be able to take it away from a hot kettle or something? <laughs> It, wasn't, it actually wasn't a very kind interview on my part. <laughs> but when somebody says something perfectly fatuous, it's very difficult to be nice afterwards. <laughs> but, but people injure themselves, and, they ha- and there's some, just if you look on YouTube, they have some awful videos of people having, having dead flesh being cut away from their limbs, and they don't need to use the anesthetic because they can't feel it anyway, and it's, it's awful and because because leprosy is still out there and I say that it's not deadly people die of, of uh, other infections that they're actually vulnerable to okay so this this thing goes on for a long time and then I'm thinking about how how it is an example I mean we 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 have um, Sandra has a relative who he ha- he got he's married and, and he has three girls and uh, 
um, they have grown, they've gone through college and everything, and they follow the, the liberal narrative to the word, to the word. And by the way, uh, anybody who follows any narrative apart from the narrative of Christ to the word is going to become unsensible, non- nonsensible in their thinking at some point. There can be a lot of things that are true, but nothing makes it 100% all the way, okay, than the word of God. But we all know that the liberal narrative has problems from the very beginning. He follows it to the absolute point. And of course, I've seen these signs which say, I believe in kindness. I believe in kindness and I believe this, that, and the other, and this little line that's going down, and I think you don't even know what kindness is. You wouldn't know it if you fell on it. Because it's a highly complex issue. Kindness is a highly complex issue. You're going to tell somebody, you're going to be kind to somebody and tell them it's okay to do what they're doing, which is going to make them go to hell. Is that kindness? Is it unkindness then to tell them that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing? Is that unkind because they're going to feel offended and upset? Believe me, when they get to hell, they're going to wish somebody had told them. And they're going to wish they had listened. All we need to do, we got that window with the, uh, uh, the rich man, the rich man and Lazarus, every benefit that he had had on the face of this earth evaporated instantly he got there. So what this, the, younger, the youngest daughter was down uh, in Washington and she had the misfortune of coming under the thrall of a young man who needed uh, a wife in order to stay in the country. And she married him out of kindness. And then after he had received his papers, he, he divorced her. This narrative of kindness made her do this. Narrative of liberal nonsense made her do that. Like a person with leprosy who doesn't realize they're injuring themselves who has lost that sensitivity, she will carry that stigma for the rest of her life. They don't even recognize it. They don't even realize it. She didn't. And here it is. A sweet child. She didn't have the sense, and I don't mean, you know, the senses. She didn't have the sense to say, this isn't right. If I marry somebody, it should be that I am going to spend the rest of my life with that person. It isn't an instrument of immigration. Not for somebody like that. And she is a sweet child. Breaks my heart. So, there's these ten lepers. And as he entered, verse 12, as he entered the village... He was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. Of course they would because they're out. And lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And so they, they say his name, Yeshua, or the uh, Aramaic uh, equivalent, and they call him Master like rabbi and <clears throat> so they have recognized in him who he is but not necessarily his great power but they have heard of it and they ask for mercy very common in the approaches to the Lord where people are asking for healing they just ask for mercy <clears throat> and he, when he saw them he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. So, he doesn't say, I'll heal you. He doesn't say, I'll have mercy on you. He simply tells them to do something. And we see, we know, we see this with Naaman. Elisha didn't even come out and talk to him. He didn't have a ceremony or anything like this. Go wash seven times in the Jordan. 
go. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, go to the priests. Of course, in this is a laden statement because that's what you do when you get cured. You go to the priests. And remember the man who was born blind. He puts paste on his eyes and tells him to go wash in the pool of Salaam. And then he receives his sight. And it says, as they went, they were cleansed. Well, ten people obeying an order, pretty good. It may well be that I have to speculate about these things. Sandra tells me not to do it, but I have to speculate. I think, you know, there were probably one or two guys who really had it, and so they started out, and then the rest followed. It really, and she'll say, what does it matter? And I'll say, yes, it does matter, you know. (laughs) So that's my little speculation, okay? But they all got, they all went. We don't know how far they had to go to get to, to get the healing, but they obeyed. And it says, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turning back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. And so, you know, as uh, the fact that they were on that border, it's not surprising. You can see that uh, the society of lepers Uh, doesn't have the same prejudices as uh, the regular society. Samaritans could hang out with Jews under those circumstances because it was just a miserable state. But the man came back. The man came back and did what the blind man uh, did. Uh, he, He worshiped the Lord. Give glory to God. We all need to give glory to God every day for what he does, for who he is. And here is this man giving glory to God. And Jesus answers, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? So we see uh, this man, like Naaman, a foreigner as well, gave praise to God. Now we come to another long passage. So shuffle around in your seats and get relaxed or awake because here's what here's what the Lord is doing I mean of course it's a wonderful thing to heal these people etc but there's a method and what he's doing is he's going to bundle nine people all at once down some commentators say they will have had to have gone to Jerusalem that's that's 60 70 miles away I don't know quite how that works. I don't know enough about this. And so I am sorry about my uh, ignorance there. But we're going to go to Numbers, sorry, Leviticus chapter 13. If I go here. Chapter 14, I'm sorry. So I'm going to read this, and it's going to be long. I'm not even going to read it all. I'm going to read the first uh, 20 verses. Now I want you to think about the reaction. Now he, he, has, not, he has only healed a number of people once before, and that was two blind men. Now in Matthew there are two more two-man healings, but they're not corroborated in the other two Gospels, Luke and Mark. Luke and Mark, they're one person. But Matthew has an earlier healing of, a blind, of two blind men, although he touches both of them, okay? So that's the only multiple healing, per se, that he's taken. 
And here he's healing 10 men in one shot, okay, and sending them down. In chapter 14, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go out of the camp. And the priest shall look. Then if the case of leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in blood, in the, in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed by the leprous disease. So as we listen to this, multiply it by nine because there are nine people coming down. Here it is, boys. You don't believe in me? Well, get to work. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field, and he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe himself in water, and he shall be clean, and after that he may come into the camp, but live outside his tent for seven days. And on the seventh day he shall shave off all his hair from his head and his beard and his eyebrows, and he shall shave off all his hair, and then shall wash his clothes and bathe in his body in water, and shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall make two male, take two male lambs without blemish, and one ewe lamb, okay, so that's 27 lambs, a year old without blemish, and a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, and one log of oil. The priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed and these things before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall take, well, where, we, where we're saying tent of meeting, we're now talking temple, of course. And the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it for a guilt offering along with a log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And they shall kill the lamb in the place where the kill they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the place of the sanctuary for the guilt offering, like the sin offering belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who has been cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. Nine times. Then the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it in the palm of his own left hand and dip his right finger in the oil that is in the left hand and sprinkle some oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is the guy you're going to kill, is it? This is who's done this. This is the guy you're going to kill. I see. Makes a lot of sense, right? Nine people cured of leprosy. And some of the oil that remains in his hand, the priest shall put on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot on top of the blood of the guilt offering. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand shall be put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. Then the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest shall offer the sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterwards he shall be kill, or kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be clean. does go on in case the guy doesn't have enough money for the lambs okay but and I but I didn't want to I didn't want to go on a tedium but we see we see now the plan if they don't get it after all of this their hearts are hard So they're taking, going back to uh, going back to Naaman. Naaman gave glory to God. He wanted to take some earth back from Israel to build his own altar. You can speculate about the issue of him having to go into the temple of Rimmon, and it's and the fact that Elisha gives him uh, gives him permission to do that, as it were. But in the end, 
Neyman's going to have to get new work, you know, because that won't work forever. So here we have back into uh, back to Luke 17. We have, and he said, um, he says in verse 19 to the man who is prostrate, prostrate, prostrate before him, and he said to him, "Rise and go your way." Your faith has made you well. Well, here's here's the decisions of translators. And the more I look at translations, I wouldn't want to be a translator. Because this is this is an unfortunate way of translating this word. Um, because <clears throat> ten men got well, but only one guy got saved. And this, this word can be used for being saved. In other words, for coming to a saving faith and knowledge in Jesus Christ. The, only the King James comes close by saying, it has made you whole. But they can't be credited totally for that because it's an ornate way of saying that you're well. So I, I'm altering this translation to say, your faith has made you saved, has saved your soul. I sincerely hope that this is not an indication of the proportion of people dying or will who ultimately at the end of the age will die. I hope that those saved are not only 10% of the population. I remember reading uh, where where they, they had talked about a falling away in the 19, I think it was the 1930s or 40s, 1930s maybe, a uh, falling away from Christianity in, in uh, Britain. And Lewis uh, maintained that it was not a falling away at all. It was just that uh, chapel in the universities was no longer compulsory. And so you really found out who the rural, the rural Christians were. Um, I know it was compulsory in the school that I went to, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure that had it been voluntary, there would have been a tiny amount going. So this is uh, just more of, uh, of the Lord's plans for the people as it comes closer to his crucifixion. We've got actually quite a few Sundays to go before then, so you can see how concentrated everything becomes and intense this great battle goes on. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, for the uh, your word and uh, for this information about this healing. We thank you. We thank you for that Samaritan who came back and gave glory to you. Let us give glory to you at all times, and let it cleanse us. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.